Greetings, this is Stan Houston, and uh, yes, my friends, you read the title right. Here we go. If Jesus were doing his ministry today, and he was choosing his team, and he had one position left, and uh, there were two people who were eligible and qualifying for it. You, that's right, you and Donald J. Trump. Those two people can have one of the last positions. Who would he choose? And why do you think so? Well, today is Mardi Gras. This is the day that uh, brings uh, the carnival. And I've lived in carnival countries and it's wild and crazy. And supposedly you get all of that out of your system because of course tomorrow is Ash Wednesday and the start of Lent in which we ought to take life a little more seriously. Well, I'm certainly not a fan of the carnival and Mardi Gras event by any means. I've certainly seen how bad it can be for lots of people. And it's certainly not my style. But it is where people do uh, some wild and crazy things. So I thought this topic might be just wild and crazy enough to uh, set us up for thinking about some serious things because starting in Lent I am going to do a series of meditations and presentations on this subject. Being an apprentice to Jesus the Entrepreneur. During Lent I'm going to seek to discover what it would mean to be an apprentice to Jesus the Master Entrepreneur and how that could help me in my life, in my business, and the career of service that I'm seeking to have. And particularly for those of us who perhaps are in our encore career. This is our final go at it. How about us? And this might be the uh, Lenten time we discover our encore purpose, mission, and joy and hope. So that's what I would like to do today with your permission on Mardi Gras. Fat Tuesday to talk about that subject. Exactly that. Now, of course, uh, this is going to make some people mad and it might make people glad. By the way, I'm not going to show any overt bias, but I will at the end proclaim a little bit of a bias that might be influencing my thinking as I, I kind of lead the discussion on this. I also know, as I said, people will get upset and uh, that's okay. My spirit is clean because my intentions are clean. Uh, years ago when I was uh, trying to write my first book, I was talking to an editor and uh, she was very strong with me and she said uh, a lot of the questions that go into uh, writing a book. And then uh, she said to me, uh, well Stan, what do you want people to, you know, to feel or do or think about your book? And I said, well, you know, I, I, I don't want it to be helpful and useful and I want people to like it. And she put her hand up and said, Stan, you don't want people to like your book. No, you want them to hate it or love it. <laughs> Think about that. You want them to hate it or love it. Vanilla is like, make it bold, make it bright, make it powerful, make it challenging. They'll love it or they'll hate it. Well, I, I don't know if that'll be quite the feelings that come out of this little 20 minutes or so or whatever it lands up being, but here we go. If Jesus were doing that today, I think from my leadership work and my long studies that I've identified seven things that I think he might be looking for. Now, there are a lot more, uh, I'm sure, and obviously we don't have anywhere near the mind of Jesus that we should, we should try to do that, you know, kind of have the mind of Jesus Christ, but we're going to miss it no matter what we come up with or no matter how bright or how hard we try. You know, you first of all might say as well, uh, you know, oh, Jesus would choose the one who would be the better Christian. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, you or Donald Trump, who's the better Christian? Uh, how would you define what a better Christian is? And would that be what Jesus is truly looking for? Well, I just simply ask the question because 
That is the usual answer I get when we decide who would be kind of in the uh, select circle that he might choose to do the work. I think, first of all, he wants somebody who's bold, a bit of a disruptor, kind of, you know, someone who uh, moves things around, uh, someone who kind of is, uh, you know, rock and roll guy. Uh, he chose Peter and he named him Rocky. <laughs> and we know the story. Peter, one of the boldest and brightest and bravest and toughest and also a betrayer. Um, but the character of Peter tells us something that perhaps uh, he wants some boldness and some disruption and some people who uh, really move and uh, have that spirit about them. I also think he would like someone who would be a little bit entrepreneurial. Now, he was himself, you know, uh, he wasn't a teacher, he wasn't a prophet or a priest. Uh, it doesn't seem that he had any formal education that we talk about, except that what a, a young a Jewish boy at that time would have received in the home or in the community or in the synagogue. Uh, it doesn't seem that he, uh, and there were universities of uh, sorts at that time. There were places of higher education of sorts, but it doesn't seem that any of that was part of the deal. Uh, Peter was a businessman. <laughs> he had his own fishing business, tough business. Jesus was probably uh, a kind of a handyman. We oftentimes say carpenter, but uh, as the word is, it, it's someone who does a kind of fixing up, repair work, uh, was more of the term of it. And it, it also appears that some people think that he was actually a bit of a stonemason, that that was the kind of the work he did. And uh, obviously he must have been pretty good at it. Um, and uh, obviously he did good work and uh, he uh, got the business. He had a mother and a, uh, brothers and sisters, it appears that he has to help support, and uh, that's what he did. So he was probably seeking someone who was a bit entrepreneurial, a bit creative, because uh, after a while he's going to take three years and then he's going to say, hey guys, hi gals, go do it, you're on your own, except there's going to be one addition, and I think some of you know what that might be. But, uh, you know, uh, you, won't, you won't get the training manual. You won't go training. You, you, you're going to have to, once you uh, learn the deal, you're going to have to do the deal yourself. So I, I think he was looking for people who were, at least he sensed, entrepreneurial. I think he was looking for people who needed saving. <laughs> you know, uh, these were quite some characters. Well, you know, Matthew... Matthew was a crook, <laughs> you know, he was cheating people. He was working for the Romans, perhaps, uh, and uh, he was a bit of a crook, as uh, many politicians or politicals were. Uh, that's just the way life is, and that's why sometimes we don't want to trust them, and maybe why we shouldn't sometimes, because it's, uh, power does seem to be corrupting, and perhaps he wants people who admit or know they need saving. Now, keep in mind, the characters in God's teamwork were not the best of characters. Deeply flawed men. And one time uh, that expression was used about uh, a mutual acquaintance. He's deeply flawed. And I just said to my friend with a smile, and you're not. <laughs> I am, you're not, he is, and I am, but you're not. Just a question. The, the seven heroic entrepreneurs of the Bible that we've identified in our own study, uh, Moses, David, St. Paul, hey, it appears they were killers. They had blood on their hands. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> What do we do with that? Um, well, I think there's something that says that uh, Jesus was going to choose people who he knew, uh, knew or discovered that they needed saving. They needed rescuing. 
as uh, the guy and gal who finally goes to AA says, hey, I need help. <laughs> I'm in a mess. I can't figure this out by myself. I need rescuing. I need saving. So I think uh, Jesus would perhaps look for someone like that who uh, knew that. Um, interestingly enough, and it's a badly used and sometimes abused word, but uh, uh, they were people who were concerned about uh, greatness. <laughs> they really were. You know, we'd like to be on your right hand, left hand side, you know. You know I mean, they asked the question, who, who will be the greatest? Uh, and obviously, uh, they had some concerns about that. Well, he took them anyhow. And they wanted to make Israel great. I mean, they, 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 were, they were patriots to their country in that sense. Uh, they were certainly people of the law and of... Uh, Jewish faith, but that was pretty well centered in their uh, particular uh, country, the, the people of Israel, the tribe that they were from. Now, uh, Jesus began to confront that, and later on, of course, St. Paul really brings that home, and one of the hardest things for them, but they took it well, was that uh, it was greatness for all people. But... They were, uh, they were people who talked about that and uh, what it meant. And what Jesus had to do is he had to show them what true, unique greatness really was. And he introduced some uh, thinking that uh, we would call paradox. Him who wants to be the greatest will have to be the leastest. <laughs> How about that? You know, if you want to win and be great, you'll have to lose and be broken. And so, I think he would like to deal with people who were dealing with the issue of what it means to be great and how to be truly great. I'm very convinced that he wanted people who in their toughness and hardness and highness and whatever were teachable, coachable. I mean, he was looking for learners, disciples. Follow me. Listen to me. Do what I do. You know, imitate me. You know, uh, be teachable. Be coachable. I think he would look for people like that. Um, in my long experience, uh, I've found that there are people who are quite teachable, and there are a lot of people who just are not. I remember one man who said to me, uh, after interviewing me two or three times, and he said, well, Stan... <laughs> I don't think you can help me. And I very calmly, but with a slight edge, said, uh, you know what? You're right. I can't help you. I have to say this because it's true, and I'll be truthful. Uh, I found that there are basically three kind of professional categories that are hard to coach and teach. Um, lawyers and attorneys are not very good clients for coaching and teaching, unfortunately. Most teachers aren't either. And uh, a lot of ministers and pastors are not very coachable and teachable either. I just say, that's been my experience. I don't know what yours has been, but uh, I do know that God uh, would like us to be bold and broken so that we can be bold in learning and growing and teaching. Did he want scholars and academics? <laughs> Doesn't seem so. I think we have badly overestimated uh, the value of, quote, formal education. Now, I'll be very blunt, is uh, I took part of the inspiration from this from a, a very committed Christian uh, professor at a strong Christian college who, that I really uh, admire. And um, he went after Donald Trump. And he went after him in some very, very, very difficult and diff I mean, he really flayed him good. And I read it, and I understand where he was coming from. But the problem was, many of the things he was accusing Trump of, he in his own article was guilty of. <laughs> And all he had ever been in life 
was a scholar, an academic. And uh, it just didn't sit quite right with me, you know. Um, again, that got me thinking. It doesn't perhaps say that I'm unbiased or biased or out about that, but obviously that does influence me that, uh, you know, I oftentimes say an old Swedish saying that I heard. I said, you know, I don't judge. Jesus is the judge. That's what we pay him for. It's above my pay grade. Jesus is the judge. He'll decide. And as the old Swedish guy said, yep, that's right. <laughs> that's what we pay him for. <laughs> Well, I think he would have wanted somebody who really loved people. He must have known, because that was the deal. <laughs> you finally have to, in some ways, know that all of this is all about showing that God loves you. We're going to discover in some of our teaching that, you know what, there are four certainties in life, and three of them are bad. If you are born, and you live, and you grow up, you will face every day uncertainty of possible opportunity and victory, or tragedy and defeat. That's what life will be like. Life will be difficult. But if you survive and grow old, the second certainty is that if you uh, grow old, eventually you'll get weaker and sicker. Yeah, the body will wear out. Maybe the mind, it will. That's a certainty. Number three, you will die. I will die. I'm not middle-aged. I don't have many years left. Maybe you don't either. Am I in the fourth quarter? For sure. Uh, but that's a certainty. And here's the fourth certainty. No matter what, God loves me. I am loved. Those are the four certainties of life. And three of them are not so good. But thank God, one is. I think he also was looking for people who he knew when the power came. That's right. When the spirit force power came and the light went on, they would have what it takes to go and teach, to do acts of courage, to perform acts of healing, acts of connecting, acts of boldness, that once the power came and the light went on, they would have what it takes. Would Jesus choose you to be on the team? Would he choose Donald Trump to be on the team? And which of the two you think he might choose. Actually, the choice is yours. Choose well. I'm Stan Houston. This is Mardi Gras. This is Ash Wednesday Eve. This is the time when we journey to find out how we can live a more full and more fully alive and more spirit force and more uh, sparking on fire life as a Jesus entrepreneur, as a follower of the master entrepreneur. It's a 40 day journey. Join me. Let's see what happens. Let's see what miracles might happen. Let's see what mysteries are solved. And perhaps we'll learn what it is that we are to do in the year before us. All the best and blessings for you. Stan Houston at gmail.com, Stan Houston at gmail.com. 
Right now, I would appreciate your financial sponsorship for the work we do. Uh, please do that. I would be grateful. And my wife, Karen, would be grateful, too. <laughs> Thank you. May it go well for you. Bye for now.